welcome to this latest edition in our video roundtable series featuring an author and discussants. Today we're going to feature a recent book by Stephen Gottlieb, the J. and Ruth Kaplan Distinguished Professor of Law at Albany Law School. And the book, Unfit for Democracy, The Roberts Court and the Breakdown of American Politics, published by NYU Press. And our two discussants for today are Dana Schmaltz, former research associate at the Max Planck Institute for Comparative Public Law and International Law, currently a graduate student at Cardoza Law School studying comparative legal thought. And Peter Quint, the Jacob A. France Professor Emeritus of Constitutional Law at the University of Maryland Francis King Carey School of Law. Our plan for today is the following. We'll begin with remarks from Dana, followed by comments from Peter, and then we'll hear from Stephen, after which we'll have a larger conversation among the four of us on Stephen's book. So with that, let me welcome uh, all three of you. Thank you very, very much for contributing to the life of iConnect, and also for contributing to the field of comparative public law. This series of virtual roundtables has been very important, very interesting, uh, and well-watched. Uh, by all of our readers and viewers. So we thank you, we welcome you, and we're grateful to you for your time. Thank you. <laughs> well, Dana, let's begin with you. you uh, you've had some thoughts on, on the book, and so let's maybe give you the floor to kick off our conversation on Stephen Gottlieb's book, Unfit for Democracy, a provocative title. So thank you, Richard, for the introduction, and thank you for the possibility to participate in this. Um, yes, I I very much enjoyed reading the book. It's a incredibly thought-provoking piece, and I, I I felt, especially for somebody like me who's not so familiar with the detailed history of your Supreme Court jurisprudence, this what was a um, valuable critical overview, so I enjoyed it. And also with regard to um, the jurisprudence by foreign or the foreign constitutional history, the jurisprudence of foreign courts, it's um, impressively knowledgeable and it's really a piece of comparative constitutional law. Uh, so I felt it was very fitting that I first met Stephen at the conference of uh, the ICON conference last year. Now, as a general uh, proposition, the book advances um, that it disagrees with the majority of the Supreme Court in many of the decisions of last years when it states that democracy is mainly a principle which limits competences of the court and Stephen argues instead that democracy crucially depends on safeguarding fundamental rights uh, which the judi judiciary has to protect and what the Supreme Court has been falling short of in recent years. So that's central from my understanding when Stephen calls the Roberts Court unfit for democracy. So from what I understand, that uh, proposition has two parts. Firstly, it states that democracy must not necessarily be conceived to limit the competence of the court to decide, and that secondly, democracy might require certain decisions or certain substantial uh, decisions of the court. Um, and there are then within the book three main reference points um, against which Stephen measures the current position of the, port, uh, of the court, firstly American constitutional history, secondly um, the interpretation given to democracy and its prerequisites in courts of other jurisdictions, and thirdly political science and its propositions about what democracy requires or means. So those three obviously interrelate, but this distinction helped me to get the argument clear. Um, now I, I think I don't, I won't go into, uh, well there's so much to discuss in, within this book and each of those propositions and all which is said about them could be discussed, but maybe I'll jump to my very general critique and I think we can go into the details later in discussion. Now from my general impression, what's the biggest strength of the book is in part maybe also its problem that it achieves, uh, it, it deals with very broad topic and it accomplished to make it accessible and to arrive at clear statements and this comes with certain simplifications at some point. So I mostly felt this when it comes to firstly what political science says or what 
foreign courts do or what, how foreign courts um, act differently from the US Supreme Court, I felt that someone sometimes it takes a somewhat monolithic perspective on what is said, especially with regard to political science. So I felt probably one could introduce a bit more disagreement or dissonances within those positions advanced there. And so on that basis, maybe there would be two theoretical questions I would like to um, put out for a discussion. The first one, and each of them relates to examples that came to my mind. So the first one is how does, what's the role of political science when discussing um, democracy or what the court should do? So maybe in other words, how, what's the relationship between empirical analysis and normative conclusions? And what I felt in that respect is that Stephen's argument is the strongest when kind of deconstructing um, the court's arguments. So, for example, there was one thing I particularly liked that's on page 27 when discussing the case of um, parents involved in community schools about affirmative action and looking at how the court uses democracy as an argument to support its position and deconstructing why this does not work. So those are the instances where I found the argument very convincing, where in other instances when it makes more a constructivist argument, um, saying what maybe the court has missed to adjudicate, I thought that's on much less stable ground because there are usually many ways to uh, look what democracy requires, etc. So that, that would concern the question how much can we draw from empirical analysis of political science. And the second uh, ra large theoretical question I would like to put out concerns the relationship between fundamental rights and democracy. So obviously that's kind of everywhere in the book. But um, I felt that two, two things I wanted to um, remark on that. The first thing is maybe the comparison with Germany that we there have a constitutional court which is um, which engages very much in judicial lawmaking, we might say, um, and it's often criticized for taking the role of the legislator. So maybe a bit the opposite situation. And so this allows us also to speak about what's the disadvantage from such a position, which might be, for example, that it takes away the uh, um, need for the legislator to act proactively on issues. And that sometimes it might hinder, I know this the argument often advanced by the court, but it might indeed hinder a broader public debate on issues because they are framed by the court in uh, judicial arguments rather than in political arguments as they would be framed in a political discussion. And then my last point, and that follows up on this um, last thing, is maybe that we could speak about the recent decision in the case Obergefell where the majority opinion would rather speak in democracy about a way which I expect Stephen to um, agree with and state that uh, a democratic discussion has already taken place and the court would build on that and, well, well we have a dissenting opinion which takes the opposite view of that. So much as my first ideas on the book and... Well, thank you, uh, Dana, a former research associate at the Max Planck Institute for Comparative Public Law and International Law, currently a graduate student at Cardozo Law School, uh, studying under the guidance and supervision of uh, Michel Rosenfeld and Comparative Legal Thought. Thank you for your opening thoughts on Stephen Gottlieb's book, Unfit for Democracy, The Roberts Court and the Breakdown of American Politics, published by NYU Press. We'll now hear from Peter Quint. Uh, a long-time uh, intellectual giant in the American Society of Comparative Law, where we first met, um, uh, now Jacob A. France, Professor Emeritus of Constitutional Law at the University of Maryland, Francis King Carey School of Law. Peter, it's great to have you, and your, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Richard, and thank you very much, Dana, for your uh, remarks. Uh, uh, Stephen's book um, invites, uh, Stephen's very... Uh, a thoughtful and I think very richly argued book uh, uh, invites consideration of what we mean by democracy and so maybe I say a few words on this um, on this subject. Uh, for the ancients democracy seemed to be um, the rule of a particular social class, a very broad social class, people who weren't uh, 
um, members of the aristocracy and weren't very rich on the one hand and weren't uh, slaves on the other. Uh, and the ancients thought that uh, there was a danger always of democracy slipping into a dictatorship or autocracy. And there's a theme of that kind, of course, um, a very interesting theme of that kind in, the, in, uh, uh, in Stephen's book. Um, uh, unlike the ancients, we, we start with a, a somewhat different view of democracy, that it's uh, basically the majority, uh, a sovereign, uh, popular sovereignty, the majority rule of, um, uh, of, of all the, the majority of all the uh, 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 citizens. Um, uh, but majority rule, and I think Stephen's book indicates this clearly, um, is not really enough for a definition of uh, democracy. One could say that all sorts of, um, uh, of, uh, of autocrats, and one could say Hitler, for example, probably had majority support for a substantial period between 1933 and 1945, and yet uh, no one would, uh, 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 it would be absurd to, 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 to call um, uh, that regime a democracy in any of the senses that we possibly use the word. So there must be something more than, um, uh, uh, than, uh, uh, than majority control, than popular sovereignty in democracy. And, and the question is, what is that more? And it seems to me that uh, uh, Stephen's book suggests uh, this uh, question very strongly. Um, in thinking about this question, it might even be worthwhile thinking about moving away a little bit from the term democracy, which may have in it uh, too much of a residue uh, of, um, of, uh, of uh, uh, unmitigated uh, majoritarianism. Um, and there have been a lot of attempts to do this, to define what is democracy, what is liberal uh, constitutionalism. Um, uh, uh, there are many uh, attempts to do this. I think one particularly interesting one, which is discussed by Stephen also in Chapter 4, um, and which alludes to uh, some of the issues that Dana raised, um, is the uh, 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 attempt of the German Constitutional Court uh, to give a, de a basic definition of what we might call democracy or liberal constitutionalism um, by expanding the phrase to include a few other words. The phrase that the German Constitution uses is not sort of democracy just as such, but the free democratic basic order. And that's a phrase that's used in the German basic law or the German Constitution um, in, in, among other places in Article 21, saying political bar parties can be banned if they uh, seek to discard or overthrow um, the free democratic basic order. Now, the German Constitution, interestingly, does not define what this is, the free democratic basic order, but uh, the Constitutional Court, as one would expect, has uh, attempted to do this. Um, and in a number of places, but particularly in an old case, 1952, which in which um, a right-wing radical party, um, a Nazi, neo-Nazi party, was um, banned. And I think it might be interesting to compare what the Constitutional Court in Germany has said about the free democratic basic order with some of the points on democracy that uh, Stephen very interestingly um, sets forth. And in thinking about German constitutional law, always we have to bear in mind that one could say constitutional law is a mixture of philosophy and history. Um, and when we're dealing with German constitutional law, the impressive history is always, um, is always very strong. So what is the free democratic basic order according to the German constitutional court? Um, well, it has a number of aspects. Most uh, interestingly for us, it doesn't start with popular sovereignty. Maybe that's a kind of look back um, at the majoritarianism even of the, uh, or majority support of, of even probably of the Hitler government. It starts with the idea of the rule of law. The definition begins with the idea of the rule of law. The free democratic basic order um, focuses on legal regularity. Uh, exclusion of the rule of force, exclusion of arbitrary executive decisions. Um, and so it excludes the Hitler Gestapo state right at the outset in which there was no limit um, on the will of one person, that is Hitler. 
Then we have in the definition, and this is all in this 1952 case, we do have popular sovereignty um, and the self-determination of the population. Then we have third, um, basic rights, constitutional rights, and Stephen makes this point uh, also uh, very strongly that uh, constitutional rights are central for any kind of idea of democracy. Interestingly, the, the Germans don't focus for example, on the rights of criminal procedure, which are very, I think, uh, beautifully outlined and discussed by Stephen. In fact, the German constitutional law doesn't have that same focus on, on criminal rights of criminal procedure that, that, we, that, that we have developed, at least under the Warren Court. Um, uh, <coughs> but the basic rights that it talks about, the right to life, the right to the free development of the personality. So what else is in the free democratic basic order? The idea of separation of powers, that's extremely interesting. Uh, Stephen, of course, talks about that. Um, we tend to think, well, there isn't really quite a separation of powers, certainly not in the American sense in, uh, uh, in parliamentary systems such as that of Germany. But nonetheless, the constitutional court is, insists on that. And I think that's because the executive always has to be uh, thought to be particularly dangerous in light of, uh, his, of uh, in light of history, and so the constitutional court at other times has um, uh, required, for example, for uh, uh, German troops to be sent outside of the NATO zone, as required a vote of parliament. That is the executive decision not sufficient. Um, one might say, well, it doesn't matter. The executive always controls the parliament, notwithstanding the theoretical inversion. Of, 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 of the situation, uh, but maybe if there were a coalition government in which not both coalition parties were equally um, convinced of a particular military measure, that might make a difference. Another thing, there are two other things that Stephen doesn't talk about and doesn't really talk about, at least not specifically or at, at great length, because, because we don't think of them quite, in, uh, uh, we take them for granted more than I think the German constitutional law does. One is the administration has to be bound by law. That again, a look back at the lawless uh, Hitler state and really just an idea of the rule of law. And the other is the independence of courts as an essential democratic aspect. Um, again, we take that more or less for granted, except in the very interesting uh, case of the election of judges that Stephen does talk about. Um, and that's, a, that's an instance in which the whole idea of the independence, of course, rises to the fore in American uh, constitutional law. Um, uh, and perhaps the last element that the German court talks about is the plurality of parties. Mer parteien principe. Uh, you, you can't just have one party. Well, again, we don't really think about that. Of course, we have more than one party, although not a lot more than one. Um, but, uh, of course, uh, looking back at the Hitler regime and also at the uh, communist regime in, in East Germany, we have, um, um, we have uh, only one party. And, of course, coming back to the question of the independence of of, uh, of the courts, it was typical uh, in, in East Germany that some executive official or party official might call up a judge and tell the judge how to decide a case. Um, so, so this is the this is the idea of the free democratic basic order, not inconsistent with our views of democracy, but a rather different set of focuses. Let me just quickly um, uh, note three elements that are not in the German constitutional court's definition of the free democratic basic order not social welfare, although there have been discussions later on about whether social welfare ought to be considered part of the free democratic basic order. Somewhat surprising, one might say, because uh, from Bismarck on, it's, social welfare has been very strong in Germany, and the Constitution calls the Federal Republic of Germany a social state, and that is an element of the Constitution <coughs> that cannot be, the, the basic principle of which cannot be Amended. Also, very interestingly, the German constitution has a system in which um, there is a, an attempt, at least, to equalize the wealth of the various states. That's something we certainly don't have as any kind of constitutional principles. There may be federal statutes that might attempt in some ways to do that. Uh, but I think the idea of this is also for social welfare, to make sure that all states have enough resources for social welfare. What else is not in the free democratic basic order? Education not in the free democratic basic order, although as Stephen discusses, uh, it's really essential for democracy. Um, and the, our ideas, of course, go back to, um, uh, to uh, 
uh, uh, Jefferson, but we, but of course, we don't either have um, a uh, uh, any kind of constitutional requirement in the federal constitution. The state constitutions pretty much all have that requirement, and there may be hints of that in Justice Powell's uh, majority opinion in uh, Rodriguez, and also in his concurring opinion in Pilo v. Doe. And the last thing that's very interesting that is not in the free democratic basic order is federalism. Uh, even though federalism is essential in the German constitution and is also one of these provisions that basic principles of which cannot be amended, yet it's not in the free democratic basic order. Um, and uh, uh, even though uh, 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 certainly uh, both Hitler and Stalin um, were uh, were opposed to states uh, because they were competing power centers, and um, uh, Hitler uh, very quickly abolished the power of the Weimar states after he took over, and that was also true in in East Germany that the new duly recreated East German states were um, ab either abolished or rendered powerless under under uh, East Germany. But it's pretty clear that. <coughs> Since a couple of the occupying powers, uh, Eng uh, Germany and uh, uh, sorry, uh, uh, England and France were didn't have federalism. It might be somewhat peculiar to put that in as an essential of democracy. In any event, I, I, this uh, comparison I think shows the uh, um, uh, very interesting issues that are raised by any kind of definition or uh, of, of democracy and the rich. Uh, of, 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 uh, the rich possibilities that are suggested by Stephen's uh, book in this respect. I have some other points, but I think I better stop here and we'll come back. I have a couple of questions for Stephen. Try to uh, to make the to to in, uh, insert those at some later point. Well, thank you, Peter Quint. We will we will have some time to come back to you um, as we continue our conversation. But uh, Peter Quint, the J Jacob A. France Professor Emeritus of Constitutional Law at the University of Maryland, Francis King Carey School of Law. Thank you very much. And now it's uh, a pleasure uh, for me, an honor, to call upon Stephen Gottlieb, uh, a dear friend of uh, iConnect, uh, who's published this book that we're now discussing, Unfit for Democracy, the Roberts Court and the Breakdown of American Politics. Uh, Stephen, welcome. And thank, thank you very much for letting us here at iConnect feature your book. Well, thank you very much for organizing this, and thank you all for very interesting comments uh, that I truly appreciate. Um, let me just say a couple of words about, I think, each, and then there are a couple of broad things that address in different or provide a perspective on things that both of you brought out. Um, uh, Dana very kindly suggested that some simplification was necessary uh, because of the uh, quantity. Um, I'm not sure that the complexities w that w we would want to talk about were all there, but I did face a demand by my editor to cut the book down by 40% at one point. So there's a lot not in the published book that was uh, originally uh, there. So, but, but uh, regardless of that, I think Dana is clearly right that there is some simplification uh, um, uh, going on. Um, uh, let me let me um, uh, 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 jump to. Um, I think I think I want to jump to a couple of general themes that address what what both of you spoke about. Um, that might be easier than than taking things apart. Um, one is the the definition of democracy. Um, I, I was very uh, deliberate in the way that I did that um, because I tried to do a minimal definition of democracy as elections. Elections that determine who's going to take power. Uh, that's minimal. It's not actually simple because what makes it possible for that to work is is not trivial. Um, but there are uh, um, uh, uh, studies of democracy which get much closer to a, a um, this is saying I'm not 
connected to the power source? Oh, I see why. Excuse me. No, you're okay. There we go. I just had to turn the power source on, and I didn't realize I hadn't done that. Um, uh, there are studies of democracy which um, uh, get, get very um, um, uh, detailed and, and substantial in what they require. And if I went to a definition like that, I felt like it would seem like I was assuming my conclusion. And I didn't want to do that. So I very deliberately chose a very minimal definition of democracy. If um, I, I'm, I'm blanking on the gentleman that participates in the International Political Science Association, who's the, the father of a prime minister of uh, Finland, um, um, Van Hanen. And, and he has... Uh, based on Dahl's definition, a, an extensive description of what's more democratic and what's less democratic that he relates to a whole set of uh, conditions uh, in that society. Um, and I didn't, I, I didn't want to start with that. Uh, so what I tried to do was to show the way that the political science suggests that the minimal needs to be backed up because I was trying to build on the political science in order to um, uh, develop my critique of the court. The other side of what I covered, and Peter is exactly right about a lot of things that I did not cover, um, uh, and, and there were multiple reasons for those decisions, but some of the things, for example, I removed a chapter on education. It was there and I pulled it out. And the reason that I pulled it out was that the things that I would have really wanted to talk about in that chapter just didn't get decided by the Roberts Court. There was more on the Rehnquist Court. There was uh, the, the things on the Roberts Court tended to be about integration rather than how education should proceed. So um, what I actually talked about was uh, determined by the court um, and, and I tried, in that sense, to, to, uh, to be much more uh, focused in the argument that I was making. But Peter is exactly right uh, that there were, and, and Dana as well, that there were many things that I did not talk about that in a full discussion of the requisites of democracy need to be there. Um, and I, I can only uh, ad address those by saying you're absolutely right. Uh, in terms of telling the story about the Roberts Court, there was a reason for me not to go there. Um, but, it, but it wasn't um, uh, for lack of agreeing with what both of you are, are uh, 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 saying. Um, um, uh, the... Um, uh, the the uh, case that Peter was uh, talking about uh, that made a, a, a an extensive definition of uh, uh, of uh, the requisites of democracy. Um, that's uh, as I read that decision, and and you two are both experts in German constitutional law, and I have to say when I got ready for this interview, I thought about the fact that uh, um, uh, y y you both were going to know uh, much more than I would about uh, that, uh, that area. Um, but, but my understanding of that uh, decision is that uh, ev everything Peter is saying is correct but that when you look at the pattern of subsequent decisions, some of those other pieces are there. Uh, so that subsequent decisions do talk uh, to some extent about the economic piece. And they go back to the Weimar Constitution uh, and the fact that the Weimar Constitution is actually referenced in the, um, the German, uh, um, I'm not sure I'm going to pronounce it right, the Grundgesetz or Basic Law, of the Federal Republic of Germany, 
Um, and, and so some of those other elements do actually play a role in German constitutional law, although there's no way that I'm going to question the point that um, uh, the, the court stresses other things uh, more. Um, uh, but I do think that there are other pieces of German constitutional law that, that also um, uh, 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 come in. Federalism was, was a different issue for me um, because, uh, and again, there were materials on federal. I actually published an article about political science and federalism um, uh, several years ago, you know, as part of the run up to writing the book. Um, and my argument was addressed to what was then the Rehnquist Court, and I argued that the Rehnquist Court wasn't going to be addressing the things that were important to political scientists. Um, again, the Roberts Courts. Um, stepping into the waters of federalism has been largely in the um, um, the, the the gay rights uh, and, and, and excuse me in the, in the well partly in the gay rights context but partly in the Medicaid context or or uh, Obamacare context um, and um, uh, it it, uh, it didn't. Um, it, pre it presented a, 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 uh, um, a view of, uh, of federalism in, in the, it really presents, the, the court presents a very inconsistent view of, of federalism. Uh, and so ultimately that's the point that I probably would have made, which is that in some of these high profile political cases where it doesn't like uh, the federal rule, it presents a very strong view of federalism and a very weak view of nationalism. But then there's a whole bunch of cases where it likes or it doesn't like the state rules and uses the federal rules to overcome them. So in a way the, the, the um, court's devotion to federalism is very inconsistent. And um, it, it doesn't um, present a picture of federalism that actually gets to the kinds of things that political scientists worry about, but it really hasn't done much to hamper it either. Um, uh, because what they worry about is that federalism will be a source of, of a battle. So Richard, for example, comes from Canada. And uh, Canada has had this battle between uh, the French-speaking uh, francophone portion of Canada and the Anglophone portion of Canada and it's to a significant extent defined by a provincial boundary. That's the kind of thing that worries political scientists more than uh, almost anything else um, and that doesn't that hasn't come up in a clear way on this court so um, uh, I, that's the way I would have addressed it um, but di didn't feel it was appropriate to do in this book. Um, but but I appreciate the point that you're making that there are significant considerations of federalism with respect to the separation of powers is a different issue, um, and that is that the political scientists um, uh, have not found that either the presidential or the parliamentary system is more effective at protecting democracy than the other. Um, and largely the presidential system gets tried out in Latin America and doesn't work very well. Uh, and the parliamentary system gets tried out in Europe and works pretty well. So our notion of the federal, uh, of, of the separation of powers seems to work well here, but um, uh, there, there isn't a strong a political science view in in conjunction with either with either one, so uh, that was that was my take on on that issue. I think I've been um, vocal for probably too long, and I want to uh, uh, stop and and thank you again and turn the mic over. Well, thank you, thank you Stephen, for your responses to Dana and Peter's comments. I think what I'd like to do is um, is go to Dana to give Dana a chance to get back into the conversation as we 
um, have a dialogue among among the four of us. But first, Peter, I just want to note for uh, our our viewers that at first glance, the, the title of the book, one might not appreciate, in fact, um, the the richness of comparison that the book incorporates within it. Uh, Unfit for Democracy, the Roberts Court and the Breakdown of American Politics suggests to the casual reader that it's strictly an Americanist view on the U.S. Constitution, but in fact that's not the case. The book engages at different degrees of intensity with the Constitution of Canada, the Constitution of India, uh, France, South Africa, there's mention of Iraq, mention of Italy, mention of Latvia, Japan, Burma, Colombia, I mean the list really does go on. Uh, and it's a rich work in comparative public law uh, with very deep insights into what you see as the pathologies of the American uh, constitutional order. So I just want to flag that uh, for, for our viewers because it is, it is a, a work of comparative public law. Uh, Dana. Yes, thank you. I'm still thinking on what I've heard from both uh, the previous speakers, but um, maybe the um, on one point, which was raised by both of you, Peter and Stephen, um, and well, first on this uh, number of issues which is not included in the free democratic order, from in the view of the German Constitutional Court, but no, nonetheless figures as very important constitutional requirements. I wonder if it really matters whether it falls under the understanding of democracy or as another important normative constitutional principle. So when we speak about whether the court must somehow respect in its jurisprudence, for example, federalism or uh, social welfare, does it really matter whether it's put as democracy or as something else? So that's um, something which might just be a question of terminology. But then when it comes to, uh, let's take uh, economic inequality, and I think we all agree in a way that this relates to democracy and um, both of you have said that well, even if one starts from majority opinion it easily becomes clear that um, what's necessary to in order to have majority opinion work um, will lead to consider many more social issues but when we then speak about economic inequality and see this is a problem for democracy can we really say that vice versa from democracy we can follow something on how the issue of economic uh, inequality should be dealt with. So, for example, if there's disagreement between uh, those who favor a free market economy and those who favor more state intervention, can we say anything on this dispute based on the principle of democracy? And I don't think so. So, I sometimes feel it comes back to this um, back and forth between fundamental rights which need to be secured and the uh, majority opinion which in some cases might decide on how those fundamental rights are best secured and it seems to be a very difficult issue um, to draw anything on what the court should be ruling there and I think um, because we, I feel so far we're speaking a lot about what belongs to democracy but when we Speak about how the decision on those issues should be allocated between the legislature and the uh, jurisdiction and the court. Then maybe we we need to um, first of all acknowledge that there can be reason with disagreement how to reach the, those fundamental principles. Mm -hmm. Stephen, what uh, what do you think about that? Do you have a, a response to that? Um, Democracy folds within itself uh, a multiplicity of, of standards, of understandings um, that maybe defy the kind of agreement that you're pointing us to. Um, actually, that's another example of a chapter I pulled out, which was going to be called Can Capitalism Save Democracy? Uh, uh, but, but that's not there in, in, in the book. But the, the political science has been about the economic disparity as opposed to the system. And, and I think um, saying that there are economic conclusions 
or that democracy says something about economic decisions is not to, is not to say it says anything about all economic decisions. So I completely agree with Dana that there are a lot of decisions that don't necessarily implicate democracy or that we don't have the scientific basis to make that claim um, scientifically. Um, uh, and uh, I, I think um, one can make a claim at the extreme that a totalitarian system is, in, in, in the sense of a system that incorporates every aspect of your life, uh, regardless of how the rule is, is constructed at the center, uh, has some dangers because there's no way out of the system. There's no outside there. So uh, a number of political scientists have pointed out that in some of the third world countries where there isn't a sort of capitalist background, um, holding on to power is crucial because leaving power there's nothing. Um, so uh, th there, there is at the extreme clearly uh, some implications uh, to be drawn, and 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 I think that's right. But but there is a lot of uh, of 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 space where there are alternatives. What I attacked on the Roberts Court is that there has been such a pattern of uh, favoring the major economic players and disfavoring the ordinary folk that it has had the effect of helping to skew uh, the disparity in this country to what may be dangerous levels. I know Peter Quint had uh, a couple of additional points uh, he wanted to raise, so perhaps Peter, now is a good time to raise one of those uh, points. Okay, let, let me, um, thank you, thank you very much. I, you know, I, I think, um, let me just say about one thing that um, uh, uh, that Stephen, or a couple of things that Stephen said, I think the discussion of preemption um, was really fascinating, and um, uh, it seems to me uh, exposed sort of the cynicism of uh, of the majority of the court um, in, a, in a very interesting way. Um, so, uh, and also uh, there is very interesting stuff about education uh, in the interstices, even though you had to take the chapter out. Um, uh, let me just uh, ask maybe two questions, if that's all right, um, uh, that, that I was not too clear on. Um, when we say that the Roberts Court is working against democracy, um, which is the burden of, the, of that chapter and in a way the burden of the book, um, uh, I, I wasn't entirely of uh, one, one way that that could be conceptualized is to say, well, each of these decisions that helps, that assists the, 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 the differential in income uh, or that uh, disregards individual rights could be making the country less democratic. And so, but even though it still remains basically democratic. That would be one interpretation. Another interpretation, and sometimes I think we can say this or get fairly close to it, is to say that somehow an accumulation of decisions like this threatens or talk, threatens to move the United States into a tr to, into truly undemocratic territory and become an autocracy. Um, uh, if you're saying that, and I think there are, as I say, some passages that seem to suggest that, what's the mechanism for that? How is that going to going to happen? Um, uh, that was one thing that I that I was interested in. Let me just say one last th one last question very quickly. <coughs> the last section on methods of interpretation also extremely interesting. Um, uh, advocate sort of democratic interpretation uh, of the Constitution. Um, does that resolve Bickel's anti-majoritarian difficulty? Uh, what's the relationship between that method of interpretation and the underlying um, anti-majoritarian difficulty raised by Bickel? So those are my two questions. Stephen? Okay. Um, first of all, thank you for bringing up the last chapter because 
that was important to me. It, from my point of view, it is one of the objectives of the book to discuss uh, a constitutional interpretation and from my point of view set it back on a better premise than it, than it has been. Uh, Bickle, by the way, may have been one of your teachers and he was one of my teachers, uh, although to make it very clear, I took a seminar from him in which he co-taught it with Emerson and it was a paper course and Emerson and Bickle spent the whole time arguing about whether my paper was right or wrong. And I barely got a word in edgewise and Emerson was my supporter, Bickle was not. So you can take whatever I'm going to say uh, uh, for what it's worth. Um, the counter-majoritarian difficulty suggests the direction that the Roberts Court sometimes goes in, certainly not consistent in going there, which is to say, as Dana expressed earlier, we shouldn't go there. Democracy is a reason not to do this. Um, my problem is that if the court does that, gradually the mechanism can spin out of control and take things over. There are, and, th and that goes to Peter's question about what is the mechanism. There isn't one mechanism. Uh, there are many mechanisms. Uh, one is that if the legislators are allowed to take control of uh, who is elected, then the notion that we elect our rulers is really gone. Um, uh, New, New York has had, uh, well, it's, it's interesting in a way in New York because we've had a Democratic Assembly and a Republican Senate since 1970, uh, and before that both of them were Republican for a long time. Um, as it's been explained to me, the 1970 reapportionment was a Republican mistake. They were in control of it and they goofed with respect to this. But the difference between those houses makes clear the power of gerrymandering and the Republicans' ability, at least until very recently, to stave off any electoral control. So there are ways in which, uh, and, and we've had various periods in history where this has happened in different ways, um, and, uh, but there are ways in which the people in control can protect their own uh, their own power. Uh, that makes this less democratic. But then also there are ways in which um, uh, there are various scenari scenarios in which it can lead to literally a coup of various, of various forms. And uh, much of the history of the loss or the breakdown of democracy in much of the world uh, is about uh, coups. Sometimes it's the military taking over, sometimes it's uh, more rarely it's a revolution, sometimes it's uh, the authorities taking over with the support of the armed forces. Uh, so um, uh, uh, in, in different ways um, all of these mechanisms can lead to things which function as a coup but it's not like there's a single mechanism. That was really the weakness, I think, it turned out of some of those that tried to do it with game theory. Uh, they, could, they start with the position that um, uh, we've got a very predictable relationship here. Um, that may be stating it too strong, but we have a relationship which is strong. Um, uh, and but then trying to map it out as if there's a single way doesn't quite work. Um, so uh, I, I can't answer with a specific mechanism. With respect to the suggestion of two ways that I might imply it, I think I mean both. Uh, in, in the way that I was talking about if the politicians manage to insulate themselves from control, then the fact that we're letting them do it is allowing us to become less democratic um, and to the extent that there is a threat of a sharper uh, takeover of some sort, uh, then we're talking about the accumulation of 
things in the, in the country that threaten our willingness to accept a democratic system. So uh, I think the answer is both, and, and I appreciate your your uh, pointing out. And and so uh, that last chapter to me is saying it's crucial that we take account of this, even if it only means that when you decide cases in these areas, you think of it as a weight on the scale. Stephen, thank you. Um, I'm going to call a close to our conversation very shortly, but first, um, just one remark and maybe one one question. Um, the remark is, is, I guess it's also a question, Stephen. It has to do with your understanding of democracy, which has really been the focus of our conversation uh, most of this, of this roundtable. I wonder if it might not be best to uh, rename your book uh, Unfit for Gottliebian Democracy, uh, as opposed to Unfit for Democracy, of a particular view of democracy, which is for, for certain shared by others. Um, uh, but the, the search for uh, a universal, uh, perhaps subjective, uh, agreeable understanding of democracy uh, seems to uh, elude you, uh, as evidenced uh, by this by this video conversation, uh, and so I say that in jest, uh, unfit for God, Libyan democracy, but only to stress the the point that I think has come out of the discussion, which is that uh, we're not able to come to an agreement as to what it is the standard that you've set to evaluate the merit and demerit of the Roberts Court. The question, however, um, is the following: is who are you writing the book for? So, who is the book written for? For me, it's, uh, I suppose you have a number of audiences. Um, and I asked the question, uh, inspired by the last paragraph of your book. I think you're writing for Americans, generally. Not political scientists, not law professors, uh, but everyone. Here's the final paragraph perhaps sounding the alarm. To protect democracy, constitutional law needs to be able to absorb the insights of science. Failing that, the court is counter-majoritarian in the most fundamental sense. It leaves us defenseless against the enemy within. Stephen? Thank you. Uh, and of course, that's another way of responding to the counter-majoritarian difficulty that, uh, and, and I appreciate uh, your, your bringing that up. Um, uh, first of all, um, again, I was not, I was purposely not trying to define Gottliebian democracy. What I was trying to say is that there are parameters that the political science community has been giving us. They don't say that American democracy needs to be the same as German democracy, or, or Canadian, or uh, Indian, uh, whatever. They do say that there are things which we have in common, because a lot of this research is based on statistical studies of large numbers of countries. It's not the only form of research, but it's a significant piece of the research. And those common problems threaten democracies that have very different shapes, but nevertheless don't solve or deal with the common problem like the huge disparities which have taken democracy down or contributed to taking democracy down in places like the Philippines and Latin America and so forth over various uh, periods of time and then they reconstruct it and it comes apart again and so forth. And there are other parts of the world that we could be pointing to where that's a threat. Um, uh, I, I, I haven't tried to repeat the statistics on the extent of the disparity in the United States but it has gotten quite significant and we're going back the comparisons tend to be to 1929, and whether you uh, uh, realize it or not, uh, that was a period when there were calls for dictatorship, uh, when some people suggested FD FDR should be a dictator, and others suggested that the government should be taken over, uh, there's somebody else should be a dictatorship. There were real fears about dictatorship in the 30s. Uh, 
And so part of what I'm trying to do is to ring the alarm that um, however we solve it, uh, we have a problem for democracy and, and, and the way we do it could take different forms, the way we solve it could take different forms, but we have a problem. So I wasn't trying to specify what Steve would like. Uh, it's easier to say Stevie and then Gottliebian, I think. Uh, democracy. Uh, well, with Gottliebian, we know it's yours and not... <laughs> uh, should, should, uh, should be. Now, the, the, uh, the, the last question that you asked was, for whom is the book written? Um, um, yes. That is to say, yes, it's written for the intelligent reading public. Um, yes, it's written for con law professors. Um, because I think we all have a role to play in keeping our democracy alive and vital. So the, the answer to that question is there isn't a single audience that I had in mind, which in some way changed the way that I had to write the book to do it for that kind of dual audience. Well, I know at least part of the book is written for academics because you have a hundred pages of footnotes uh, in the book. Uh, yeah. About 90, 96, 97 pages of footnotes. So that part is certainly not for Joe and Jane front porch. but And they're in smaller type. Yeah, yeah. So it's a, a significant work of research uh, for sure. Uh, Dana Schmaltz, Peter Quint, Stephen Gottlieb, thank you for joining us in this latest edition in our video roundtable uh, where author meets critics and this week uh, we met with Stephen Gottlieb to discuss Unfit for Democracy, full stop, uh, the Roberts Court, and the breakdown of American politics. So Dana, thank you. Peter, thank you. Stephen, thank you. And thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Very interesting.